digital transformation, creating an integrated digital ecosystem, and how effective leadership can shape an engaged workforce in order to drive business stability, employee experience, customer satisfaction, and ultimately, profits. To our viewers who've joined us this morning, feel free to share any questions the conversation triggers for you via the live chat function, and I'll pose as many of them as I can to our panel members who are with us today. In conversation with me this morning, Pat Masatela, he's Chief Information Officer at Liberty Two Degrees. Pat is responsible for providing strategic and operational leadership to IT and digital transformation initiatives, primarily focused on how L2D continues to transform its retail environments to remain at the forefront of a fast-shifting retail landscape. Professor Randall Carlson, he's Dean of the Johannesburg Business School. Now, since assuming his position last year, Randall's been repositioning this institution as the leading digital business school on the African continent. He's accumulated many prestigious international awards and has established himself as a leading fiscal authority within South Africa and a thought leader in the higher education sector as well. Both of them with me in studio this morning. And then joining us virtually, Chief of Converged Communications at BCX, Abdul Saeed as well. Abdul has extensive experience in fixed, mobile, and wireless environments, both locally and within Africa. Most recently, Abdul led the Access Networks and Internet business as the managing executive, where he continued to build new generation solutions and business partnerships and mentored leaders for future sustainability as well. So welcome to you all. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. We're going to jump straight into the conversation. And Randall, I'm going to start off with you. I read an article the other day talking about how we're living through yet another technology paradox. Like the industrial revolution before it, this digital revolution offers, on the one hand, opportunity, disruption, on the other. In your opinion, what's weighing heavier right now? Actually, I, we should welcome the disruption because the digital transformation, as we speak about it, the tools have been available for a long time. The minute we put Windows onto a computer, we no longer, everybody don't need to be a coder or a programmer. You can literally just click and move things around. So the digital tools were in our house and the internet was available for that. I think what the pandemic did was to say, whoa, you know, we, let's open up this Pandora's box and make it available to survive the pandemic. And so those businesses that initially adapted, and, and, you, and I'll throw some words out, adaptability, agility, and all of those things, because I want to come back to them later. Uh, those businesses that responded in an adaptive style and were able to cope with the pandemic, they actually have said, no, we're not going to just be business resilient. We're not just going to bounce back to the old normal. We're going to bounce back to the new normal. And so if you look at the 2021 uh, business survey done by, I should not call the company's name, Business leaders that did the initial adjustment as quickly as they did mm. are now looking at what are the new risks that I need to adjust myself for so that I'm not being caught unaware as like I was caught with the pandemic. So they're looking at geopolitical risk, and we know the situation that's happening in Ukraine. We're looking at political risk. We're looking at climate change. And we're looking at humanity, how humanity must interact with technology, because that's the ultimate part of digital transformation, is the interfacing of technology and the good that it could bring for humanity social justice, access to all, inclusivity, all of those things are now become talking points. And that is what the that is what has happened now recently because the pandemic has opened up those conversations. Absolutely. Pat, as Liberty Two Degrees, you've been at the coalface of this digital disruption, right? Opportunity or yeah. source of chaos for you? I mean, how um, overwhelming was it when this Pandora's box got opened? It was indeed kind of volume because um, one never really prepares for something like a pandemic. You know, you don't know when it's actually going to come up. Um, but you know, as Professor kind of mentioned earlier on, what we see is that um, the way companies that are already on some kind of a journey, yeah. you know, to be kind of digitally transformed, we found that those companies were able to quickly kind of like adapt. You know, um, and I guess it, it it talks to the resilience part to say that. As you operate, whilst you may be dealing with today's challenges, you also need to be kind of like planning for the future. 
and those that actually plan better are the ones that actually are better positioned to actually take advantage of what comes up. And in the context of um, LTD, I mean, initially we had a challenge of um, where, like, you know, people were, could not come into malls, and mm. that was kind of like a reality. And in our business, you would understand that uh, we do have customers that we try and bring into the malls, and then we do also have tenants that operate from within those malls. Okay. Um, so initially, it was kind of like a case of how does one actually adapt to that? Okay. Uh, but one of the things that we quickly kind of realized is that, uh, especially when we started opening up a little bit, was to say, what is it that we need to do to provide that level of comfort for people to feel that they can be safe when they come into the malls? Okay. Because mm. as you can imagine, you know, you don't want to go to a mall and you kind of like, arrived and there's thousands of people there. You know, you, people needed to kind of get a sense and we started thinking about how do we make that journey much easier for customers? Yeah. How do you make it easy for someone to come in and out as quickly as possible? Absolutely, and it puts you on the steep learning curve, Absolutely. right? So Abdul, I'm going to bring you into the conversation at this point because it really puts into focus uh, the extent to which businesses are navigating and readying themselves for an era that we've almost forcibly leapfrogged into as a result of COVID, where you know digital pathways and connectivity are crucial. How are you rating uh, the readiness of business to take this on board, embracing the opportunity as opposed to being drowned in the chaos? Yeah, thanks, Alicia. I think uh, we've seen a dramatic shift uh, in focus in businesses combine uh, digital disruption uh, that was occurring, whether we liked it or not, with what happened in, during the pandemic. And we saw most of the businesses that we deal with accelerating their digital agenda. And a lot of them started off uh, in different ways, but I think a lot of them are still struggling to cope with the rate at which the change is coming in. The velocity is immense. And uh, I was at, um, uh, at a summit the other day and someone there was speaking about, we can experience 100 years worth of change in the next 10 years. So if you could imagine, how would an organization that is traditionally set up, that may have legacy spanning hundreds of years, now adapts in this environment that we are going to face. And the only answer is to consider a digital journey, consider our core business processes and how we digitalize those processes going forward. So therein is going to lie our success and failure for all businesses. And we've seen digital disruption and the impact it's had on many organizations. But I think the one heartening thing for me was two years ago when we were all asked to up and lift and move home, they in, uh, accelerated the change that we need to make sure we digitalize our businesses. Okay, so we've set the scene, and this is the context within which we're having this conversation right now. Randall, spell it out for us. Why should digital transformation form part of an organization's overall business strategy? Well, look, if you don't do it, you're going to become irrelevant very soon. Because somewhere, some young person is sitting in a garage uh, programming your entire business model. <laughs> And, uh, and eroding your value stream. That's a real reality. I mean, that's a reality. So those such things are a real reality. Because if you look at the fastest growing companies in the world now, seven of the top 10 fastest growing companies are tech companies which started off literally in a garage. I mean, that's the reality of it. But it's not a lost cause. And people shouldn't throw up their hands and say, I'm now a dinosaur. I mean, irre irrelevant. There are steps that you can take to incorporate modern thinking. And, th and, and this is what the technology allows you to do, is to actually leapfrog divides or backlogs um, but there has to be a willingness and a commitment from business leaders to take that journey and moreover to take the role of chief change agent because business transformation is about change management you can't delegate it down to somebody else on hr manager and drive this agenda within the business uh, if, you, if you don't have that then you're going to have a challenge so, so, so that is the, the overarching, overarching uh, comment that I want to make. You could take Uber for an example. So how did people get pulled in a way that they did en masse from a taxi service into a, shall we call it, an Uber system? First of all, people went for the cost. Secondly, the cost reduction. Secondly, they saw the benefits. Safe, mm. clean, reliable. And thirdly, the most important one is, all of a sudden, Uber was able to use this database that they've created and network and to destroy any, well, 
cross across boundaries, industry boundaries. You can order your food, you can do all lot of things for them. So I'm just saying, people should be not be ignoring this. This is a real reality. It's, it's touching you in your pocket and it's going to touch your business viability going forward. Absolutely. Abdul, we've got Randall here highlighting one key ingredient and that's the fact that it's the leadership that acts as this uh, chief change agent. Uh, where the rationale is clear as to why digital transformation is a business imperative here, connectivity is the foundation on which this digital transformation is based. So how solid is the foundation, would you say, Abdul, in supporting this new strategic thinking and this changing face of business? Yeah, I think um, we, when we used to think about connectivity in the past, we used to think about connecting our different places and towns and cities and maybe your buildings and your data centers. And these days, when we think about it, um, it's really become quite a great force for change to the digital world. And we think about it, is it about providing seamless journeys for our customers? Is it about reducing pain points? And more importantly, is it, is it just about connecting people to those vital services that they need every single day? And with that mindset, when we think about our data in the digital world resides all over the planet, actually. It's not only in our private data center in our basement. Um, and the people that access our data are also um, all over the planet now. We need to rethink how we, um, how we set up our business and provide that foundation in terms of connectivity so we, people can access these vital services. Yeah, uh, practically speaking, uh, Pat, how are technology fueled disruption innovations challenging some of the, you know, the traditional mall mentality, that retail environment overall, and the old ways of thinking and doing business amongst you lot? <laughs> yeah, we've been through a lot in the last two years. So um, before the pandemic, I mean, we used to have a whole lot of people coming into, um, into our malls. I mean, we are primarily a brick and mortar kind of like business. Um, and the pandemic kind of like set in, okay, um, and obviously people could not come into the malls as frequently or as many times as they actually wanted to. Um, but added to that uh, was they then started developing new ways of doing things. I mean, like this e-commerce kind of capabilities and, you know, the people would swear that they would never buy certain things online. But it's amazing how people have actually just seamlessly uh, found the efficiencies that come with uh, shopping online. So we actually saw that, and um, we're not really over the pandemic yet, but obviously there's been much more opening up. And what we've actually seen in the last few months is that people are back at the malls, okay, at the same numbers, and in most instances, numbers that are even higher than before we actually had the pandemic. Now, it is very tempting to say that, well, we're back to the old. But we're not, because we can see also that the levels of e-commerce transactions has not actually gone down. So how we need to respond now is to recognize that we actually need to provide kind of like omni kind of like channel kind of mm. capabilities here. Because now we actually have people who come into the mall, but that are equally participative in the e-commerce space. And we need to kind of like think of ways of how do we actually make the experiences of them coming into the mall as seamless for them as when they actually shopping online. And therein really lies the difference between business resilience and business continuity, yes. right? Okay, so we're, we're homing in on that. What are some of the challenges then, Randall, that you think businesses come up against when they're going down this road and trying to navigate it all? I think the first choke point is availability of skilled personnel. I don't know, my colleagues can probably talk a bit more about that. Um, but we, I, I hear constantly, we don't have the data scientists, the people that are data security experts, and all those sort of those other things. And so we have to address that, those choke points, and not allow our, our young people to leave the country and go work in another country. So we have to build up a certain capability that we can actually manage this transition in an orderly fashion. The other thing that we have to also look at is access to technology. And I, I fully appreciate it that we are now don't have to be physically linked. We don't need physical wires anymore. But what we saw in some of our research work is that if people have access to, to shall we call it information technology I, um, and to the net, the chances of them getting a job or starting their own business doubles. 
So the digital footprint for South Africa is absolutely important. And there, and now I'm veering slightly away from your question, but that's part of the capability, the input factors that you have to get right for yeah. people to fully participate. You may have veered slightly off the, the question I was asking, but you've lent completely into a question that's come in from yeah. a viewer uh, that's tuned in today. With 40% of school children dropping out before matric, what does the National Teachability Index in South Africa need to be in order to sustain these digital strategies over the long term, if there's a risk that skilled workers might immigrate yeah. uh, to other countries, how do we avoid a situation where we land up on the moon, but later on report that we've lost the technology? Yeah. Yeah. So exactly that, and therefore government's uh, strong moves and, 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 and strong noises about digital migration for South Africans is very important, and we have to track that. We, uh, and and, uh, and see, I see some newspaper reports coming out about broadening excess for South Africans all across, um, because that's exactly linked to human capital development. You can't, it's inescapable. If you don't have access to technology, you can't do this type of human capability development. Uh, the other thing that I also have got a bugbear about is the cost of data in South Africa. Yeah. And so you automatically cut people off from getting access to data, uh, sorry, getting access to technology, and moreover, getting access to research. I can literally sit here now, and you ask me a question, and I can Google it, and I can give you a sensible answer with stats in one or two minutes. Mm. So if we can make that as pervasive as it should be, that every South African have access to data, people will teach themselves, and they'll teach each other because the knowledge systems are available and open. Before I move on to the other panelists again, uh, Randall, in this context, with these impediments that weigh accessibility a challenge, um, cost and affordability a, a challenge as well, how do you as a business start then incorporating solutions uh, you know, and integrate them into your broader strategy? Well, I, I think the transformation journey should define your strategy. You know, it's the, 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 the tables have switched. Those days of writing a strategy mm. and putting it on the shelf and pulling it out when the board chairman asks you what your strategy is gone. So you literally have to have a living strategy. We just had a strategic retreat the other day that you actually reviewed every 30 days because that's how fast and the velocity that uh, Abdul spoke about. That's how fast things are changing. Yeah. So, so we need a new leader. And let me use my business school back, uh, background now here. Yeah? We need a new leader that can be agile, adaptive, can think on his or her feet, um, uh, understand the velocity of technology, understand the, the basic requirements that they expect from the staff, the new requirements, and the reskilling that may be required. I mean, the World Economic Forum has just said, and I'd like to throw stats if I, in the, tomorrow, they said that by in 10 years' time, one third of the current jobs as we know it will disappear because the, all the routine jobs will be, will be automated. And so you have to think then, and I don't have all the answers, you as a business have to think what type of leader or what type of skills do I need for the new future that we are talking about. Absolutely, and we'll get into the detail of that in just a bit. Abdul, we're overall here not looking at a case of, I found the solution, implement, let's move on. Because not only is this a space that's continuously evolving at breakneck speed, as uh, Randall's alluded to, but we're also looking at a very integrated ecosystem at the end of the day here, a host of moving parts. So are we underestimating perhaps the complexity of what's involved to get this ecosystem operating so that it can be fully leveraged off? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with you fully um, with what you say. There's a tendency to always underestimate things initially. And when you look into the depth um, of what is required, Alicia, you will see there are many things required in the foundation, but often businesses think it's just buy another um, off the shelf solution from a software vendor yeah. or a software provider, but it's a bit more than that. We find organizations lack the skill. Uh, more importantly, we think about just taking purely um, a software system view instead of looking at our internal operations and seeing what are the things that we need to adapt here. And that, you know, just to go back on the resilience point uh, in terms of business, uh, it's about the adaptability. It's not about just, oh, we have a power problem now, let's switch over and operate from a different environment. It's how we adapt. And one of the key um, uh, principles that we've implemented in our business is to take a long range view but in that long range view, create at least four scenarios on which you can pivot. 
And, and, and when you find yourself in that situation, you may have to have an organization that's able to adapt and pivot to that scenario that you find out there. So I think uh, we very often underestimate it, but in the scenario development, you will find that you uncover more and more opportunities for the organization to improve itself and then be able to be resilient through these, uh, the, the, these changes that we are faced on every single day of our lives and then adapt and adapt also means keeping your customers in mind, your community yeah. and your customers in mind, and how do we impact those customer journeys going forward? Pat, as um, a business leader within Liberty Two Degrees and uh, a player that's been thrust into this transformation that needs to happen and needed, uh, needs to happen fast if you're going to remain relevant within your organization, how have your leadership team, how has your leadership team navigated this transformational change amongst your employees? Because that's where Randall's placed the emphasis as a key ingredient here. You've got, you, you need leaders to know what they're doing and to navigate that step effectively for the rest. Yeah. Um, and just before I get to answer you, well, what I see um, is that a lot of companies obviously are introducing a lot of technologies, okay? Um, and they go into podiums and they talk about the digital transformation that they do. But I believe that unless the people that work for you mm. can relate to what you're actually planning to do, and they can actually make a meaningful connection between what you're talking about and what they do on a daily basis, then you, you're likely going to find it kind of difficult to actually get to move. Because I think that... Developing that digital culture within the organization it is absolutely important. So if I take our case as L2D, we look at our customers, we look at our tenants, and we say we want to actually enhance the experiences when they come into our malls. Mm. Okay. But for that to happen, our own people need to be able to relate to that. You know, what would that actually kind of mean? And we actually take them through the journey and is to actually get them to meaningfully participate in the activities that we do. Well, it's hard, them, changing mindset. It, it, it is it is hard, but I think that the business fun, fundamentals are the same. They have not changed, okay? Because at the end of the day, you kind of say, we need to do things that meet the needs of our customers and our tenants. And if we are able to articulate those and say, so this is what we need to do, okay? And then we say, well, what tools do we have? Now, we're very fortunate that we actually have more and more technology tools coming through, okay? But the ultimate test is for me, at the end of the day, you have to look and say, what are the solutions that you're actually looking at? And what is it that they actually address? What is it that they actually assist you with? Okay? Mm. Because if you don't do that, you could actually end up with a lot of very expensive toys okay, that, that don't deliver value to anyone. Okay? <laughs> we certainly don't do that. Okay? And again, also just introducing our people to some of the skills without actually kind of bringing the big terms, demystifying them. You know, we talk about you know, data skills and everything. So my view is always the starting point with any data skills is to know what are the questions that need to be answered. Mm. We actually spend a little bit more time in getting people to understand the questions that we're actually trying to answer. Okay? Because it's only when you actually have clarity on the questions, then we say, well, what data do we have that can help us to answer that? Okay? And there's a kind of like a wide kind of like spectrum of skills that are actually kind of required. And you're hoping that people will actually build up until they can actually qualify to be, say, kind of data scientists and everything. Yeah. But certainly there's a play in that space for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. One can only imagine that, you know, even though COVID wreaked havoc amongst, uh, in our lives, uh, devastation uh, as well, it's had to have bolstered your case and made this, uh, this transition a little bit more uh, manageable. No, absolutely, absolutely. I think we all today benefit from working from home. Yeah. Okay, um, it was just one of those things that every business had to actually rise up to. And it's actually been availed by um, some of the technologies that are actually available. The fact that people are able to have online meetings, um, the fact that uh, just the collaboration and exchange obviously is not the same as when you're looking at each other face to face, but it's also possible. You know, um, and the amount of information that people have got access to is just amazing. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's then the very real practicalities. I want to lean back into some theory for a moment, uh, Randall. Tell us about quantum leadership here. 
as a new management approach and define that you know, for those of us who don't know what a quantum leader is? So the, the new concept of quantum leadership actually comes from physics, which I've trained in, and it's been around for since the early 1900s. And I was always amazed at how the physical world changes when you go to the very small and the very big, and it's become counterintuitive. So what you see and what I see are two different things depending on our vantage point by way of example. Mm. And I always wondered how that affects human beings and human behavior and, and the real world out there. Um, and what I also, that, that's probably what drew me to leadership and the, the type of things that I'm doing at the moment is to say, if that is applicable in the, in the nature and in the world, then how does it apply to us as human beings? And actually it does apply fully because those are complex ad adaptive systems in that particular space. Our whole nature is complex ad adaptive. You run chaos theory for a while, you see, start to see patterns emerging and that's where, that's where you get your advantages. But how does that affect humans? And we are now at the junction where we started to talk about the terms that are used in physics, agility, yeah. Uh, uncertainty, complexity, not uh, having different vantage points. And I listen very carefully to what Abdullah is saying. That is the way to go. You can't have a fixed strategy. You have to have different scenarios, different outcomes. And that's what quantum physics is to you. For any one person, the outcome might be totally different than the next person, or the scenario might give you a different outcome. In fact, they go as far as to say in a parallel universe, the other outcome might well be possible. So I'm not, I'm not trying to oversell physics here, but certainly the mathematical tools had been developed. And at that, but the understanding is there. And we need to, therefore, cross the divide and talk and see how this can benefit humanity. Absolutely. Abdul, you know, we talk agility, we talk adaptability, we talk flexibility here. But what are good leaders actually doing to ensure that their businesses are set for this growth in the digital arena? And how can leadership and change management work to shape its workforce effectively as you see it? No, I think the, the, the few important things here, uh, when we move from this legacy kind of environment to the new digital world, the first thing is to create the competence around the digital vocabulary. Now, when you start talking about the new AI and computational kind of thinking and how we use data and analytics, you start losing people in the room. And what BCX has done is starting to invest together with some of the business schools and some of the universities, invest in its people and start transforming the people. In order for them to be collaborative, I find there's a certain basic need uh, inside them to get to up to a certain level in terms of digital speak. And then they can collaborate uh, a lot better when they understand the new value of a customer in the digital world, the new value of data in the digital world. When they come forward together as a team, they can then collaborate. So I think that's the about the biggest thing is that whatever you do, and I always call it the software for business, the, the soft stuff's the hard stuff. Mm. In, in a business, you have to make sure you take the people along with you on this journey or else you create this technical debt or you create shadow type organizations that leave everyone else behind. And then when you try and scale your idea, you find it doesn't work because you weren't either diverse or inclusive in your approach. So I like uh, the approach we're taking and it's just build up that base of skills and including our leadership. We're actually deliberately now taking out some of our leaders that attend um, these advanced digital programs and making them lead the organization as well so we can understand the new ways of leading the organization as we go forward. Abdul, that being said, is it all coming hand in hand with adequate enough investments at the end of the day? Because let's face it here, there's often an underestimation of the kind of investment that's needed here. And, you know, we're looking beyond capital. We're looking at skills. We're looking at access. So investment in uh, broader than just business capital allocation. Yeah, and I think uh, if we t take a hard look at it uh, recently, you have seen how much investment has been made into Spectrum for 5G for the country as well. And we're looking forward to these technologies like the latest Wi-Fi, the 5G and fiber to come to the fore. And I'm seeing a significant amount of investment in the country's infrastructure to make sure we can enable and cross the digital divide that we speak about. 
once we once we have the infrastructure in place, then at least we know all our people have access, and we're making this direct impact on the community. Where as a community, we can create a groundswell and lift our whole country at the same time. Mm. Randall, if investment is made, the other side of the equation becomes oh, is the business imperative here. ROI, return on investment, that's what every business is interested in. How exactly is that measured? So the traditional way of measuring is also going to disappear, of measuring business viability and profitability. Because we are talking about systemic issues now here. So there's a new way of thinking about mutually beneficial uh, returns. So in other words, looking down your value chain, your supply chain, and say, how much return am I willing to take? In the past, we, take as, we took as much as we possibly could, and that was quite, quite okay. That was capitalism predatory in many ways. But the new thinking is to say that if you look at it systemically, that I have to make sure that my supply chain is still alive after I've taken my profit and that I've invested in my people as well. So this new thinking that emerged about social justice, about equality, about uh, eradication of unfair, unfairness, basically, so this, this whole thinking around and the Generation Z is actually not so happy with their parents and with us because we have almost come close to destroying the planet and we've ruined the currencies and we're fighting wars and all of those things. So there's a new element of humaneness that come out of this whole discussion where business have to rethink the way they cash in on profits. It's no longer to grab as much as you possibly can and then leave the country. It's to actually look at building sustainability. I actually do think that we underestimate the, the innovativeness of our people. Because given access to this technology, given access to uh, information, you would be surprised what people can come up with when they play on their phones or they develop apps on their computers. We just had a technology fair, and I was amazed at what these young, young kids came up with. So I think we must provide the input factors and allow innovation to flourish. I was just going to ask you, what's, what's holding back that innovation from actually being implemented? You, know, you see, in other countries, they open up data. They, I think data should be almost be free, <laughs> if you wish. And access should be free and allow people's creativity to flourish. And you'll be surprised when you stand back what the result is at the end of the day. But I've always been an optimist. But I do believe that South Africans are usually creative. African, on what's happening on the African continent is, is it's probably a story for another day. But very, very interesting things are happening on the African continent. These are key questions, Pat, because these are innovations. These are investments that can work to enhance your customer experience and processes, and that grows business, your sales, your revenue at the end of the day, while providing then your cost-effective solutions uh, you know, as well. So are we dealing with a situation here of sales revenue up, cost base down, and that can only mean greater profits? Or is that a bit too simplistic? I think it's a bit too simplistic. Um, we do have, like, obviously, multiple stakeholders. There's uh, huge expectations in terms of what we're doing from a sustainability point of view. Okay, um, there's an expectation of us being a responsible citizen, and we need to kind of like rise. So, there's a whole lot of initiatives that we actually drive that are trying to address themselves to that. Um, so, uh, you know, as a as a business, one always looks and says, you know. If I partner, for example, with a prop tech company, mm. um, we have a responsibility towards ensuring um, that that prop tech company actually continues to thrive. Okay, and therefore we look into our own kind of processes and say that if we, for example, say want to run an experiment for about six months, it might not actually be viable for them to go for six months without actually any kind of like uh, returns. So we need to start thinking also of how do we actually um, work with others and ensure that they also thrive in their respective kinds of business, which is something that probably previously one didn't actually actually put forefront, but now it's actually important because if we're going to sustain and retain those skills within the country, we need to make it viable you know, for people to go start up their own companies and everything. And, and I agree that uh, the creativity and innovations that are actually there are simply, you know, then they make more money and we can actually then benefit from that. But it's not kind of like a direct as in when it comes to rental. When it's rental, you come in and you pay for what you actually 
occupy. But in this case, it's kind of like indirect, but yeah. there's quite a number of other people that are actually benefiting from that. And so before I go to Abdul, I'm going to uh, look at a question that's come through from Ashok this morning. Uh, the end customer has fundamentally changed their thinking and the way they transact with businesses where they see value for their hard-earned money. Have businesses adapted to this change? And do you value your customers and know how to reward your customers for being customers? We um, we're always looking at how can we do that much more elegantly. Uh, no, no, absolutely. That that's one of the things that I'm actually working at the moment to say that if you prove to be a loyal customer for our malls, how do you actually make it like uh, viable for you to actually come back again? So um, we may not have kind of like a solution out there, but those are the things that we're actually working at. You know, um, but again, we need to kind of give a customer something that would be meaningful for them. Mm. Okay. Um, there's a whole lot of things that people can do. For example, um, as in most of the malls, we provide, for example, free Wi-Fi, unkept. You know, if you come into our malls, you can surf to your heart's content. You know, um, and and again, for me, that's just a, a, a value that we actually give to you know customers. Yeah. And as we add new solutions that help them to actually use whatever they have to understand what is there, what are the sales offerings that are available, what are the interesting things that are in the mall, um, then hopefully we can actually also add value you know, to them when they're actually inside the mall. Of course, Abdul, uh, retail is one of BCX's key verticals as well. So how are you rating uh, the ability of customers uh, you know, within this space to use the data they have on hand most effectively? I think it's been a fabulous journey for the retail sector, particularly in the last two years as well. And we've seen, you know, uh, the arrival of the app, Shop My app, as we go along. And uh, I'm sure a lot of us have a lot of uh, boxes from delivery companies lying in our garages. Now. <laughs> so we've seen this rapid jump towards that. But I couldn't imagine going back. Uh, every now and again, I get to visit a, a physical uh, store and it's fantastic with some of the thinking that's going on where uh, you can still visit the store, but it might just be a showroom and you might try on for size. Uh, while uh, a large part of our society still wants to walk home with uh, the goods that they acquire at the store, a lot of us are thinking, well, hang on a second. If this is the showroom, then maybe the, the delivery and with the integrated supply chain, we can see that delivered to me. And once I get comfortable with it, I'm going to use it more. A lot of us are still comfortable with walking to the store, but during COVID times, we couldn't do that. So we got used to um, this integrated value chain uh, between uh, our retailer, their supply chain, and their delivery partners to execute for us. So I think we've seen uh, the beginning of something new. Um, and uh, chatting to our retail vertical uh, two weeks ago in Cape Town, I can see already the thinking is changing. They actually said, we have things that we've started, but now that the conditions are there, maybe we can take it to the next level and we can start seeing more success in this environment. Some of the guys who started out early uh, are finding themselves left behind as well prior to the pandemic. And the guys who started out post-pandemic are actually accelerating because they, they could just start new and from mm. scratch. Some of them have gone and built brand new buildings to lead this digital world out there. But uh, I personally see we're going to see more and more of this. While the physical bricks and mortar don't completely disappear, the purpose for them may change as we go along. Yeah. Uh, what solutions are your clients after at the moment, Abdul? Is there a proper understanding of what is needed to take their business to the next level? Or is there a tendency of still trying to throw money at the problem and hoping that that's going to make it go away? We had a Pat talking about expensive toys at the moment, and it's so much more than that. It has to be. Yes, yes, absolutely. And, and I see a bit of both going on, but I think that's the journey that we've seen some of the customers. So chatting to some of the customers, particularly the retail sector, they've been throwing money at the problem in the background mm. and not realizing some of the things that they can do to optimize their work. So, so let me just say at the infrastructure layer, at the connectivity layer, what I've seen. So the first mindset is to move away from, we all had this established mindset about 
our servers, our databases, and our connectivity needs to have a certain amount of availability, 99 point something. So we always measured ourselves in three nines, four nines, and five nines. But today, as we move away from legacy to this new world, to this new world, we talk about being always on. We talk about having zero downtime. We talk about having zero trust, zero provisioning time. And a lot of our customers, could you imagine your 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 best online online retailer really retailer that you rely on and you click there and it's not available, or you go to your bank and it's suddenly not available. So we'd start thinking about this kind of always on mindset. And a lot of the customers are looking at how they transform to this always on. And with data becoming abundant now, we're seeing customers adopt for some wireless access technologies as well as fiber. So there is this race on to create this always on kind of approach for physical branches as well as for online presence. Yeah. There's been quite a few questions coming through on the chat this morning. I've got one last question, uh, Randall, for you before we take it, uh, take the conversation that way in. South Africa's social context, you know, these conversations have come up against job losses, machines taking over. How much of an issue is that for business, even if they are ready to fully embrace going down this path? So all revolutions have had the potential to cause massive job losses, but the human race is an amazing adaptable uh, species, okay? So I think that the routine jobs, are going to be uh, robotized or going to be put on robots. We've seen in Singapore where post-pandemic they didn't get the immigrants back. They just put robots in place for the routine jobs. But I think you'll never be able to replace the human ingenuity and human creativity and the human touch to, to, uh, to, to, to the betterment of human beings. So I actually think it's an opportunity for people to have more meaningful lives and more meaningful jobs going forward as opposed to drudgery and slog and just getting through the day. And I, I, I actually do believe that if humans are challenged, they, they actually respond very favorably. If you look at the uh, uh, resilience of the world economy, okay, we have had this war now, but responding to the pandemic, it actually showed to me, it tells me that humanity has gone from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset because all of these innovations are jumping out of the, out of the, the, the Pandora's box, which we described earlier. And, and so, we have to maintain that growth mindset and always be stimulated because I listened with a lot of interest to my two colleagues here on the panel about how they're adapting to the new shopping preference, all these things. Shopping might just become an adventure one of these days because I can do virtual reality shopping. I don't have to go into a brick and mortar wall where I can get my measurements taken up. It will be a bit of a challenge. With BI, <laughs> but uh, And do a virtual shopping without leaving my house. And perhaps the new generation might just do that. Say, I don't want to waste my time going into a shopping mall. I'm going to do a virtual tour, order my stuff and go and play with my kids outside or go hike in, in, in the mountains somewhere. I, one of our students have designed me a virtual office. Mm -hmm. I can walk into my virtual office and it is like I'm working from the office. So I'm just saying we have to maintain this growth impetus. It's not a, a, an event. This is going to be with us for a long time. So the pandemic has woken us up. We can't afford to go back to sleep, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've had, like I say, a lot of questions that have been coming through the line. So I'm going to pause for a bit and use the opportunity to tackle uh, some of those questions. We're going to push as many of them as we possibly can to our panelists this morning, time permitting, of course. And let's perhaps uh, start off uh, with you, Randall. What can South Africa do more to encourage creativity and innovation besides offering free Internet access? Um, we have to create the environment for people to thrive in and use that creativity. And again, unfortunately, we have to build the, we have to have the foundation in place. We have to fix our education system so that our kids can, can progress as opposed to having to struggle when they go to the next level um, so that their brains are developed. People say st students when they arrive at university, they're underprepared. I say they're actually underdeveloped. And so, so we have to invest in that. And then I think creativity cannot be prescribed for. You cannot say, I want this following outcome. Allow creativity to flourish. Yeah. You know, so putting in place the basics and allow it to flourish. I've got to ask you, what conversations are you having with policymakers, with government on things like this? What needs to happen and the pace at which it needs to happen? Because South Africa is all too familiar with blueprints, uh, but the actual implementation is a pretty big challenge. So we as a business school talk a lot to government, 
Mm. And I think our voices are being heard because we see a lot of activity now starting to take place. I'm talking about physical infrastructure being put in place. Google is landing in July a very thick line undersea cable at, in Cape Town that will triple our bandwidth and hopefully, not hopefully, it should bring down the data costs. So we are on government's case all the time pointing out these advantages, you know, and um, and having to try to think of, to think differently about government investment as opposed to just brick and mortar all the time because now all of a sudden you have all of these other options available. We are thinking about the health, for instance. We think about agriculture. And so we make these opportunities visible. We make it transparent. And we say these are the expected returns that you can get from it because it's not always about money. It's about sovereignty. It's about food security. It's about how you're going to collect your taxes into the future. Africa's going to become a free trade agreement. The borders are going to disappear. Yeah. So how do you balance the national interest with this fast-paced development? It's not just a business imperative. It's a societal imperative. We are policymakers must get to the same level of agility and responsiveness and creativity as we see in the private sector. And the private, our private sector has been very, very creative. I must give my colleagues their due. <laughs> um, but we need to get it spread across society. Yeah. Pat, as creative as you have been in the private sector within Liberty Two Degrees specifically as well, and as fast as you've adapted and shifted to accommodate the times, it's got to be pretty unnerving when you're sitting next to someone who says, uh, you know, malls may be irrelevant or redundant uh, down the line. So how do you gear up for that? And what is the future of retail looking like for you down the line? Yeah. The one thing that I've actually learned is, um, the needs of customers are ever evolving. You know, whilst I'm kind of like listening to... So you're saying there's always going to be a place for you. <laughs> <laughs> and let me give you an example. One of the trends that we're actually seeing is that people who establish themselves fully digital are beginning to ask for brick and mortar spaces. And we ask ourselves, well, it's kind of like counterintuitive because you're already kind of theoretically on low costs and everything, and that's what people like. But I think there's a social element that people are always looking for. Okay? Mm. Um, if you buy something online and you are alone at home, there's mm. no one to talk to and say, does this shoe fit nicely to me or not? Okay? You but take a picture, you, you WhatsApp your nearest friend. <laughs> those are some of the technological sort of solutions that are actually coming to the market where you kind of say, well, some of these digital stores are actually establishing a physical kind of like presence, okay, because they recognize the importance of that. And on our side, we're also thinking, well, how could you kind of, and I call it physicalize the digital, okay, where you say you could still be operating from home, but can you create a platform where you're sitting together with your friends and you kind of like shopping together, albeit not in the physical store? But again, that social element of actually getting to meet people, walking past people, it's, going for coffee and everything. I must say, That's it's really interesting to see and to hear the kind of uh, gears that are shifting in mindsets right yeah. now and how people are, uh, you know, approaching the future. I was, I was yeah. going to chip in and say to Pat, you can always design a few avatars to go shop with you. <laughs> uh, but what he's, what he's saying is actually about, is actually true. Man is a social animal. Absolutely. I'm talking about man, I'm talking about encompassing genders. Um, all genders, but um, that social element and the humanity associated with digital transformation should never be forgotten and never be lost because the transformation is about improving the lot of humanity, yeah. not become uh, avatars in space. Abdul, it's all the social engagement that you're missing out on at the desk here, but we're going to bring you in as best we can here. And uh, perhaps a very apt question, given the fact that uh, human beings are very social by nature, working from home has increased productivity and efficiency in the past two years. Do you agree with that statement? And, you know, is it a phenomenon that's here to stay, given what we've just been discussing here? Yeah, I think that's just been one of our greatest challenges dealing with it. Uh, I must say, when we were asked to go home that first 24 hours, I was uh, definitely uh, not thinking of that. I was thinking of, can I get special permits for everybody to start working? <laughs> from you and every and then, other business. Uh, <laughs> exactly. And then as things moved along, I found we adapted so quickly. And uh, the people that... Uh, took to it initially who struggled are now, um, you know, so comfortable with the environment. What I did see happen, uh, uh, Alicia, and for the viewers out there is 
people became a little bit more tech savvy. When you're in the office, you always call the IT guy to come and help you and do stuff. You didn't know how to drive Excel or, or PowerPoint, even Microsoft Teams. It's taken us to another level of engagement. Now, when you have meetings, the guys have meetings so professionally. Um, these are the guys who struggled with technology in the office. The second thing that I've seen is the consumption of bandwidth has increased dramatically. Personally, I was using, I now use 10 times more bandwidth than I used to use because at home now we've all become aware that we can uh, watch movies, we can work, we can connect to people who are across the planet and dispersed. And then people started to take it a step further and they thought, well, hang on a second, this work from home thing is one step. Can I take it another step to work from anywhere? And we've seen a lot of the guys now moving to just this work from anywhere kind of environment. So there's this nice blend between, you know, uh, our, our, our people management team says it nicely, uh, Saturday, uh, Monday morning starts at Saturday at two o'clock now, yeah. because you feel connected both to your family and your, and your society and your work all given at the same time. And it's actually a nice warm feeling that you get. Abdul, as you uh, see this ramp up in usage, uh, you know, start to escalate, uh, will nationwide digital adoption increase the generation of e-waste exponentially? What can be done to mitigate this risk? I can't remember the last time I saw a SABS logo on products to ensure high quality and longevity of products, thus minimizing waste. Yes, yes, yes. And I think, and that's part of the transformation of our society. And what we do is when we embrace something new, we'll go all, all at it. And then suddenly we realize, hang on a second, there's something here that we haven't dealt with. And e-waste is one of those things. And how we adapt to that uh, and, and move along, you will see many, many people will start having this realization. Because I think it's that awareness and realization first. And then we start adapting as organizations going forward. So as we and, and this is part of the important thing about bringing the people with you is you've got to bring people with you on this journey and make sure there's awareness and education about all these kind of things going forward. And I think in this new digital world, we're going to probably set some new rules and some new boundaries going forward on how we handle these things. Yeah. Pat, uh, a question for you. How can South Africa fast track rural and township economies? Any ideas on, on that from your side? And perhaps, you know, how are you looking at that space as LTD? Yeah, um, I think it's, it's absolutely important to actually do that. Um, we, in, within our portfolio, um, we do have a number of assets. For example, we have uh, operating out of Michel Spain at Promenade. And we can see the difference that it makes to have a mall in that environment. We also have a mall out in Bonsabelo. Okay, out just outside of Bloemfontein. Um, and it's about the convenience. You know, it's about kind of creating the spaces where people can actually go out and do a whole lot of things efficiently all at once. Okay. Um, but I don't think that every other place kind of necessarily needs to have like a mall. I don't think every mm. place needs to have a mall. Um, but if one looks at some of the solutions that are actually coming to market, you know, where you could say, you know, perhaps in the rural areas, you still want to give those people access to everything, you know, just uh, to, as far as they can actually afford it. And perhaps they, with smartphones, they could actually buy and then you actually have some fulfillment centers, you know, where people can actually go and pick up their stuff. And that would also make their life much more easier. Because today in South Africa, if you live in a rural area, if you want to do groceries, you need to plan a day to go to a big city to yeah. go and purchase something. And I think that that eats into time, that eats into productive time because those people could be maybe farming and using that time to do other productive stuff. And if we can actually assist, come up with solutions mm. that kind of like preserve people's time and make sure that they can make it, use of it more meaningfully and kind of like benefit from whatever solutions are actually out there. You know? Randall, it ties in with another question. How important is language in terms of this digital transformation and this path that businesses are looking to go down? Should translation into the 12 official languages be prioritized first? Should the same approach be applied when the Bible was translated into various languages to spread the word? How would you explain to a grandmother in the rural areas what machine learning is or what she potentially has access to when it does become available? So that, that's a very important question because um, we don't intend to convert everybody to coders and, and software engineers, okay? <laughs> yes. 
So, yeah. but we have to have the ability to interface with technology and mm -hmm. understand it and appreciate it because it's another imperative as opposed to just driving business. We also have to, to become tech savvy, savvy mm -hmm. to protect ourselves from predators out there. I mean, there's lots of e-crime happening. So as a society, we need to become much more aware. But coming back to your specific question, I think, uh, and I listened very intently what Pat was saying about incorporating the rural areas. We, this, we have the ability now to form communities and ecosystems where people can interface in their own culture, in their own language, and in their own comfort zones electronically. And we, we've been working on what we call uh, an enterprise development ecosystem. And by way of a simple example, you can drive down costs so tremendously in the townships where one Spaza uh, owner don't need to go to town to go and buy flour because they ran out, and I use this very simplistic example, there are most, much more sophisticated examples, where you run out of flour to make a fed cook and you have to now take the taxi to town to go and buy. You go into your ecosystem, you see the lady next door to you might, might have reserves or oversupply mm -hmm. of a particular thing. And once you're in that ecosystem, and we have played around with it, these Ecosystem participants are extremely sharp. So all in all, convenience, costs get driven down. People have more time to be productive mm -hmm. and more time also to spend with their families. So coming back to the language, I foresee an ecosystem where Isitosa is being promoted and cultural activities are within a particular ecosystem where I could dial in because I'm interested. But, you know, so there's all sorts of possibilities now starting to happen. And I want to emphasize the point, we all don't have to become engineers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But these are happening and happening within certain parameters. Abdul, yeah. perhaps a last question to you looking at risk, and it's something that uh, Randall's mm -hmm. highlighted here. I mean, are developments with regards to digital security keeping up as we see this evolution happen? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a dance that's been going on for a long time mm -hmm. now, Alicia, but in particular, we've seen recently how it's impacted us uh, with the likes of the, the TransUnion credit bureaus, Transnet, stopping stuff going in and out of ports. So for me, whatever we do, this future, this exceptional experience that we imagine for our society and for our customers must include a very, it must include security at its heart. And it's not just physical security, not just network security, but also cyber security, because we're moving into that digital world. Yeah. And in that digital world are other players. And we have to be aware that there are other players. Often these players are already there, not knowing when they're going to take advantage of the situation, but they are there. And, and, and BCX has established a very comprehensive cyber security division as well to assist our customers with that journey, not just in incident response, but in building Make sure we imagine that we build a secure, uh, a secure digital world for our customers and for our employees and our society. Well, we're going to leave the last word with you, Abdul. Thanks so much for having joined us remotely uh, this morning. Uh, it's been a pleasure hosting all of you, Abdul, Randall, Pat. Uh, what a pleasure it has been talking and getting to grips with this topic. So thanks so much for your time. Thanks so much for sharing your perspectives with us. And I'm sure our viewers this morning take with them many new ideas to apply to their broader strategic thinking. To our viewers, thank you for tuning in. Do remember that this dialogue has been recorded, though, and the link will be shared in the thank you mailer, which will be sent out after the event. So keep an eye out for that. And finally, a special thank you to our partners, BCX, Johannesburg Business School, and of course, Liberty Two Degrees as well for their involvement in this very important discussion, a discussion that uh, does not fit into uh, the scope of one hour. But let's leave it there for now. From me, Alicia Sekum, it's goodbye.